from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I am Carolyn Brown. I direct the Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center here at the Library of Congress. Um, and it's my great and sincere pleasure to welcome you here uh, this afternoon for what I know will be a very um, interesting and um, mind-expanding lecture by Dr. Manuel Castells. And the title of the lecture is Networks of Outrage and Hope. Um, before we begin the program, which is about networks and digital things, I'm going to ask you, though, to turn off the buzzing of your digital things. If you would turn off cell phones and anything else that will go off and interfere with the uh, program recording and the speaker. Uh, the John W. Kluge Center, uh, which has organized this event, was established by none other than John W. Kluge with a very generous endowment to create a scholarly venue on Capitol Hill where the finest mature scholars might have opportunities to bring their wisdom and their knowledge to the nation's leaders and policymakers. Um, a space where, as we like to say, the world of affairs and the world of ideas, where the thinkers and doers might have the opportunity to come together in mutually enriching uh, conversation. The center also um, supports a rising generation of um, the world's most promising junior fellows as well. And the idea is that these two groups, the seniors and the juniors, will have an opportunity, at least from time to time, to come together and, and form a, um, a very vibrant intellectual community. Um, in connection with that, we also have a number of lectures, occasionally small symposia, um, based primarily on the work of our scholars, although occasionally we'll do a, a, a small conference on something else. Um, if you want to know more about the center and the programs, you can sign up at the back table. I'll leave your email and we'll send you RSS feeds, and there are also brochures that will tell you more about the Kluge Center. Today's speaker, Dr. Manuel Castells is the Kluge Chair in Technology and Society, an authority on the information age and its sociological implications. Dr. Castells is a university professor and the Wallace Annenberg Chair in Communication Technology and Society at the University of Southern California. He is Professor Emeritus of Sociology and Professor Emeritus of City and Regional Planning at the University of California, Berkeley, where he taught for 24 years. Um, he has other appointments, but I'm not going to go into all of those. I could go on too long about him, but I am going to uh, say that Dr. Castells is a member of the library's Scholars Council. Um, and in his time here this summer, which has been too short, uh, but in his time here this summer, he's been very helpful to the library as we've thought through um, for ourselves the implications of the digital age on our work. Uh, Dr. Castells has been tracking and studying the communications revolution for 25 years. Many, many of us may not really realize it's been going on that long, but in fact it has. Um, I'm not going to provide the titles and details of the over 26 books he's, are, he's authored, um, but to give you what I think is the most concise statement of what he's been up to for these 25 years, um, or I guess it's more than 25 years, but um, over the, the major part of his career, I want to cite, read a citation um, oops, that was um, read. He, in March, um, he received the Holberg International Memorial Prize from the Parliament of Norway. And I think their citation very wonderfully and concisely sums up his uh, accomplishments. Manuel Castells is the leading sociologist of the city and new information and media technologies. His ideas and writings have shaped our understanding of the political dynamics of urban and global economies in the network society. He has illuminated the underlying power structures of the great technological revolutions of our time and their consequences. 
He has helped us to understand how social and political movements have co-evolved with the new technologies. So this is an opportunity for all of us to understand and learn in new ways from our distinguished colleague, and I can now say my friend, Manuel Castell. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I th let me just in one second um, express my gratitude to the Kluge Center and particularly to its director, uh, Dr. Carolyn Brown, for giving me the opportunity to share with you this afternoon my most recent research, which concerns precisely the relationship between and new technologies and new social movements. Certainly these social movements are not created by technology. Technology in itself doesn't produce anything. It's the technology weave into the fabric of society, culture, politics, uh, which really becomes significant. Um, so um, in the last two years, uh, unexpectedly, a number of major social movements uh, spread in countries around the world, from Iceland, where the most important movement started, to Tunisia, and then from Tunisia to uh, most Arab countries, and then from Spain to the United States, and all these are specific connections. It's no conspiracy, but it's virality. There are specific connections. And then from there to the world, in fact, uh, they had been, in the last two years, they had been demonstrations, occupations, uh, in thousands, thousands of cities around the world, including over 1,000 in the United States. They are map in my book. Um, and this goes on. Just this week, uh, the student movement in Chile uh, just uh, uh, searched again. Um, and this is a relentless wave of social movements, largely beyond the attention of the media and the indifference of the politicians. So, even you know, in a country that didn't have this kind of social movement, Israel, uh, in July, October 2011, had the largest social mobilization of Israeli history, with more than 500,000 people in a country of one million people participating in demonstrations, sittings, etc., for several months. Uh, and again, the media have not reported uh, carefully, unless there is violence, and then, of course, this nice footage. Um, the motives and outcomes of these movements are very diverse. In the West, they were mainly prompted by um, protests against the mismanagement of government of the major financial crisis that started in 2008 and still goes on, ask Europe these days. In the Arab countries, by a combination of food crisis and uh, the rejection of the dictatorial regimes that had had many specific expressions of protest, but that were savagely repressed and destroyed over the years, including the last one in Egypt in 2008, and suddenly the governments could not cope with it. In, even if there has been such a diversity, in all cases there was an individual and collective feeling of outrage towards social injustice and of humiliation by the arrogance of the authorities. These are two key feelings in the matter. But what I want to argue in this lecture on the basis of observation is that there is a largely common pattern that transcends cultural and institutional context. To identify this pattern, I did over all these last two years field work in, uh, by myself and by a network of collaborators, colleagues, students uh, in a number of countries, including Spain, United States, 
several European countries, the Arab countries, and also we examine a number of secondary sources and reports on the internet. The result is a book about to be published. I could say even this is the first time I specifically address the content of this book. You could consider it the launching of the book, but probably the regulations of the library would not allow the actual launching of the book uh, that will take place in London in early October. Um, it's a book titled uh, Networks of Outrage and Hope, and uh, it's published by Polity Press. And the only reason I'm citing it is not a, 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 a commercial advertising, is simply to tell you that I will go to the essence of the matter and uh, you can find in this book all the empirical details, all the data, all the appendixes, all the things that I'm saying. I'm not saying they are demonstrated, but at least they are illustrated by uh, the material that is gathered and presented in this book. And more than that, uh, the analysis that I will present here and in the book is still preliminary because we lack sufficient perspective and we don't have enough information. Uh, so it, all this is very tentative. However, uh, this analysis, in fact, is rooted in a much broader framework of uh, theory, what I call grounded theory, which is theory always uh, supported by evidence. This is the only theory I do. Um, presented in a book published in 2009 by Oxford University Press, Communication Power. Communication Power, uh, that book presents a theory of power as based on communication um, with a number of cases studied, but fundamentally it's, it's a theory of power. Uh, and I will give you this theory in a nutshell, uh, so that's a convenient way to summarize uh, 600 pages, uh, to, um, to express the notion that we, this is the background of what we are going to go in specifically into the movements. Um, because it fits, it fits. Um, and when it doesn't fit, I will change the theory. I will not change the data. Um, the, my point is that power relations are the most important subject of a study in social sciences at large for the very simple reason that they are the foundational, the foundational relationships of society. Because those who have power shape the institutions of society according to their values and interests, as simple as that. So let's say power relationships are the DNA of society, all right? Um, chercher la femme, no, chercher le pouvoir. So, power in social theory, we have a long tradition of theories on power, basically you can reduce to two forms of power, which are often combined in history. One is the trajectory of intellectual uh, understanding of power that comes from Machiavelli to Max Weber, power as the monopoly, the legitimate monopoly of violence. Myself, I take out the legitimate. Power as monopoly of violence, legitimate or not legitimate. Coercion, that the state, power. But there's another tradition which throughout the history of social theory has been extremely important and less often cited by both right and left. Power as persuasion, power as cultural hegemony, from Gramsci to Michel Foucault. Power as the ability to shape the mind. I would even say in the formula, just to simplify things, uh, that shaping the minds in the long run is more effective than torturing the bodies. Because ultimately, our decisions, our behavior is governed, fortunately, by our brains, by 
our minds that include at the heart, the brain. And therefore, if people ultimately think otherwise that what this established in the values and interests of the institutions, ultimately, this will permeate the institutions or will change the institutions and therefore will change. And so fundamentally, fundamentally, the power is in our minds. Although there is always a combination between coercion and intimidation and um, persuasion and framing the mind as George Lakoff and a whole uh, stream in political uh, cognition, cognitive science argues now. Framing the mind is the most important thing. However, this does not mean that we are all governed by ill-intentioned people manipulating or repressing us. This is power relationships. And therefore, relationships are relationships. This is not one side, it's both sides. It's power and what I call counterpower in all societies. If we would have the one rule to understand history in the human species is wherever there is domination, there is resistance to domination. Now, how this resistance is expressed, with which kind of outcomes, but it's, it's, a, it's a different matter and a matter of specific context. But fundamentally, the whole dynamics of history is institutions being shaped by those in power and then being resisted by those who don't have enough influence or representation in terms of their values and interests and ultimately overrunning uh, the resistance of the dominant interest in the institutions, sometimes through violence, sometimes through election, sometimes through moral persuasion, and ultimately creating new institutions which reproduce new power relationships, which will be challenged later by new people who are not represented, etc. But you would say it's a romantic vision of history, but I say it's an empirically grounded vision of history. Uh, that's why revolutions are always betrayed, but in the way of betraying them, there is some changes in relationship to what happened before. Now, if persuasion and reframing the human mind is a fundamental part of social dynamics, how this happens? Well, it happens through the minds, right? Uh, by necessity and how the mind works. I'm not a, at all a neuroscientist, but neuroscientists have already detected that they work through communication processes, meaning what reaches our brains are signals from social networks, natural networks that through communication networks reach our neural networks. And our neural networks process these signals, this information, in relationship to the stock of knowledge, ideas, images, etc., that are already installed in our networks, and they work with this material. Communication being understood, of course, as the process of sharing meaning through information exchange. Now, if communication networks are critical in, for the formation of uh, our intentions, our values, our behavior, it becomes obvious that if there is a transformation of communication in society, there has some effects on the transformation of these networks and therefore on the transformation of the human mind and the, pro and the way in which human mind processes the signals of our social and natural environment. And there has been, as we know, a dramatic transformation in communication technology, organizational transformation and institutional transformation in the last, let's say, 20 years. Um, Caroline was mentioning that uh, what people think is the future, in fact, is the past. Uh, to, in many cases, I remind you that the, the internet uh, was deployed for the first time in 1969, so it's an old technology. Uh, there are simply new incarnations and new forms of, of communication from this matrix of the network of computer networks. This transformation, uh, which is multidimensional, has many aspects, and that's what is analyzed in my communication power book, but in one word, 
is the shift from mass communication to mass self-communication. Not that traditional mass communication disappeared, but it's also been reshaped by the new forms of mass communication, which are self-communication. They are mass because they can reach everywhere, like the traditional mass communication. But at the same time, these are networks that are multimodal, interactive. And the messages can be self-directed, self-created, self-retrieved, and self-combined. And since everybody does this, ultimately the network of communication becomes a multimodal, interactive, global, local communication network. This is mass self-communication. You can say it's internet plus a mobile uh, wireless communication. Now the internet is basically all and will be increasingly so uh, and wireless. Uh, is the combination of, of, of both that uh, provides the technological basis in the broadest sense of the social structure of the what I defined time ago as the network society, but in more specific terms in relationship to the transformation of socialized communication, of communication that can reach everybody in society, is a deep transformation of this system. Now, counter power has been organized around social mobilizations throughout history, always, which is what we usually call, at least, I call and we can discuss it later, social movements, which are not necessarily with political targets, but they're social movements aiming at uh, changing the values of society, the way we think about everything. Uh, the women's movement, environmental movement, uh, but in history, the movement for liberty, the movement, the civil rights movement, uh, so movements that are specifically aimed at changing the way we think things in society. And by the way, they can be of different political and ideological tonalities. They're not the good guys of the social movements against the big bad bull for the political system. No, uh, political system can be nice and evil, and the same thing for the social movements, and can be racist social movements, sexy social movements to restore patriarchalism, etc., etc. in both ways. It's simply an analytical distinction. Now, from this point of view, what I'm going to analyze and present is the common patterns of social movements in the internet age. Not the, it's essential that they are in the internet age. It is essential that they use the internet and wireless communication platform. But of course, this is not, uh, this is the, the medium. This is not the cause, this is not the source, but it's important, has a specific consequences, and this is what I will try to show. Um, Attention, here, I'm not normative. That's something that usually gets people enraged with me in my work and in my lectures, that even if my sympathies are obvious, although not very clear, um, the, um, when I do my analysis, when I do my research, I take a huge analytical distance, and I am not normative. So regardless of my personal sympathy with some of these movements, not with all, uh, please take it as an attempt to report back to you what I have found. And then we can discuss on that. And when, when uh, you will argue, well, but this is not right, I will tell you what the movement would respond, not what I will be responding. That's very important, because as a person, as a citizen, I'm fully involved in society. As an analyst, I am the, the most traditional kind of academic trying to establish what I find in terms of the traditional practices of uh, scientific research, whatever scientific means in every context. And so, here is my report. Um, social movements throughout history usually emerge from a combination of two things. The, the deterioration, the degradation of living conditions that make the life of people at one point unbearable. And on the other hand, by the deep distrust vis-a-vis -vis the political institutions that manage their lives. It's the combination of two. We are in trouble and people who should manage our lives are not responsive and they do their thing and not our thing. Throughout history, in every instance, the two things. Um, and we know that in the last 
years, the two, the two elements had concurred in most of the world. We can later talk in the discussion about uh, uh, the different uh, the state of affairs in, in different parts of the world, which should uh, provide some nuance to this uh, analysis. But fundamentally, this is the combination of, of both. Um, so when this happens, that is, life deteriorates or something outrageous happens, and then institutions are not responsive, then people take matters into their own hands. And by doing so, they quit the institutional avenues, the procedure institutionally defined to express their protests and to present their ideas and their projects. Well, this is risky behavior because the institutions are constructed to reward you when you follow the rules and to punish you when you don't in many different ways, starting with uh, delegitimizing all actions in the media, anarchists, terrorists, uh, Nazis, whatever. So not only repressing with the police, but repressing in the mind, these irresponsible people who want to destroy democracy. They just forget to say that most people in the world think there is no democracy, and this includes the United States and Western Europe, with the exception usually of Scandinavia. All the data on the, on the opinion polls the, or different sources of the last 10 years are in my book and you can check it there. That's crisis of legitimacy in the traditional political science uh, uh, analysis. Now, in the historical experience and in the movements that I have observed, social movements are emotional movements. They start with emotions. And here I connect with the most recent neuroscientific research, Antonio Damasio and others, that show the fundamental role of emotions in triggering, shaping, organizing the human mind. From their feelings follow, and from their this more rational decision making follow. But they, at the roots, emotions are fundamental. So these social movements are not programmatic movements are emotional movements that start with emotions. Which kind of emotions? And here we have a whole uh, field of research in political science and in political communication, uh, which is uh, associated with the, uh, all, every, every field of thought has a, a little label. Well, the label of this one is um, the uh, theory of affective intelligence. What would be in political communication, political science, the equivalent of the emotional uh, intelligence in, in psychology because all comes from the main source, the neuroscience as uh, understanding emotions as the motivation of human behavior. Um, so, in specific terms, what the theory of effective intelligence on the basis of experimental psychology, experiments in, in psychology, argue, this is not me, this I'm just incorporating a whole series of studies, argue that the trigger of social mobilization is anger, which is a psychologically defined emotion. And the repressor is fear. The repressor is fear. And by the way, in some interpretations of why fear is the most fundamental emotion of human life, this is not scientifically proven, but some of the psychologists play with that. Um, it's linked to evolutionary theory. Why? because we are all the successors, the heirs of cowards. Because those who didn't run fast enough because they were courageous, they were eaten up. And therefore, there is a selection of the species in which the more courageous you are, the less likely you are to survive, and the less likely your children and grandchildren uh, will be there to exist. So, self-preservation is linked to cowardice, therefore to fear. And fear is the repressor now, but this is not a fatality. Fear can be overcome and is overcome. Fear triggers anxiety, which is uh, associated with the avoidance of danger. But fear is overcome 
by sharing and identifying with others. I am trembling, but you are trembling too. Let's hold hands. And you are trembling too. Let's hold hands. And then becomes a circle. Why people hold hands in any social mobilization? Well, we are all trembling. And when we cannot uh, hold hands in the street because the police comes too quickly, we hold hands in the internet. We get together in the internet. We share, we identify. And just by being together, not agreeing on anything, just agreeing on the anger, on the anger, not agreeing on a program, not voting for a party, just we are all angry. And then by sharing anger, but sharing it together, through togetherness, fear is overcome. And when fear is overcome, then there is a process of mobilization, which then shifts, again, psychological uh, research, shifts to another very potent positive emotion, enthusiasm. So you go from anger that overcomes fear to then enthusiasm that things can be different, hope. That's the title of my book, Outrage and Hope, the connection between the two. Now, this hope and this mobilization is organized from the very beginning through this sharing, through what people call communicative action, meaning people communicate, they share, and then they share projects, they share enthusiasm, and they keep growing together, building networks of communication. The recent transformation in the field of communication allow people to build autonomous communication in the internet networks with much less, I wouldn't say not control, but much less control than ever in history on the part of the established powers, be it political or economic or media uh, corporations. We can discuss later about that, but it's clear that uh, even if the internet is still controlled and so on, in fact it's not is surveilled, surveilled. What is the difference between control and surveil? Well, if the important thing is to share the message and to build the networks, uh, if you are surveilled, what the repressors will find is who said that, and then go and get it. But the message goes, the message goes. So if you are the messenger, that's a problem. But if you are the message, you live forever, you don't care. And therefore, therefore, there is communicative autonomy built into the new system, which therefore can form and reform networks constantly by the simple ability of these networks to reprogram themselves. So the movements that I have studied and those that are similar and are around the world come from this pattern come from crisis of um, the economy, crisis of legitimacy simultaneously, outrage provoked by unjust actions, um, and at the same time, they are able to form quickly and autonomously in the internet networks, and then they go into collective action. They require an emotional mobilization triggered by outrage and by hope of a possible change. I would argue that more and more these type of movements represent the emergence of a new pattern of social movements, which I call in the internet age because they could not take place without the internet in this particular form. Again, it's not there caused by the internet, but their shape is caused by, by, by the internet. As, let's say, the working class movement in the 19th century could not have formed without the process of industrialization and the connection to large scale assembly factories where the working class was materially formed in addition to the uh, pubs where the movement then could be connected. So the factories were uh, the, the moments of formation of the networks and the pubs were the moments of hope uh, toward the future. There are a number of characteristics of these movements of all these countries of what I, what I have studied. So rather than giving you uh, 
nice anecdote from here and there, which we can do later if you persist to, to the end of the discussion. I am going to synthesize what I have found that is common in all cases. And look, we are talking about uh, Tunisia. We are talking, I did not talk about Iran in this book, but the 2009 movement in Iran was quite similar. We are talking about Tunisia and Iceland. Nothing can be more different, but there are common patterns. We are talking about Spain and, and, and the United States. We are talking about Chile. We are talking about uh, England. Now, the intensity of the movement the success of the movements and the outcomes of the movement are very different, but the pattern is very similar. Why similar? First of all, and then I'm going to give you my, my laundry list about the different uh, aspects that together form a pattern. They are network, of course. They are network first, always first in the internet, uh, because it's the space of um, communicative autonomy where they can form and organize and emerge uh, from this chaotic system of outrage uh, and so that people without often knowing each other get together in the networks. The most important case is Egypt in which the 2008 mobilization in traditional terms uh, was crushed before it could emerge while in 2011 uh, they, they started in the internet following the example of Tunisia and they form in the internet on a large scale, a critical scale, before going into the streets, before going into demonstrations. Um, so they form first in communication networks. Why? Because communication networks have always been at the source of social movements throughout history. Would be pamphlets, would be preaches from the church or from the uh, mosque, uh, where it could be led later on radio, television, communication has always been at the center of social movement because only by people getting together in their minds, they can act together. Otherwise, they are already parcel organized, institutionalized, controlled by the institutions of society. However, the networking, even if it always starts in internet or in some cases in the uh, mobile phone networks, um, which of course more and more is the same thing than the internet, but it's both things at the same time. Um, but even so, the networking form is multimodal. It includes social networks, online and offline, as well as pre-existing social networks, family networks, friends networks, and very important, in the case of the Arab countries, soccer club networks, fans networks, very important. Remember why, uh, uh, unfortunately, a few months ago, in Port Said, uh, a police provocation killed the, the, the many, uh, literally hundreds of fans, the Al Ali, the Cairo, uh, the Cairo uh, soccer team, because the Al Ali fan networks have actually been decisive at the beginning of the revolution contacted through the internet, but once the, the thing were in the street, the soccer fan network. So everything that is network, meaning what? Connection between individuals, not organizations, not banners, not flags, not parties, no leaders, networks. People connecting to each other, trusting each other. Um, moreover, Networks are within the movement, with other movements around the world, with the internet blogosphere, with the media, and with society at large. Networking technologies are essential because they provide the platform for a continuing extensive networking practice that evolves with the changing shape of the movement. The movement evolves, the networks in the internet evolve easily without anything to be decided or agreed upon. Moreover, they do not need a formal leadership and no command and control center. They, or, they organize themselves in, in terms of the decision. There's no, anyone who would say, do that, it would be debated in the networks. And where things go, go where the network goes. Again, a fundamental uh, characteristic. This decenter structure maximizes chances of participation in the movement because they are open-ended networks. You don't need a membership card, you don't need to 
agree on anything, you go into the debate and you go in certain mobilizations and not in others, depending on how you connect to the network. It also reduces the vulnerability of the movement to the threats of repression, because how you kill a network? You kill one node in the network, the characteristics of the network, they reproduce themselves. They have a biological logic. They keep going. You cut a node, there are many other nodes. That's why I have proposed the term that these are rhizomatic revolutions. They are rhizomas. They are underground, they emerge, they, they go down, but they all are connected all the time. And sometimes emerge in the internet, sometimes not, sometimes going to the square, sometimes going to political mobilization, etc. Moreover, networking of the movement protects the movement not only against repression, but against its own threats of bureaucratization and manipulation. Anyone trying to uh, manipulate or assume the leadership of the movement with no one telling him or her about that is immediately flamed. No survival. The more you want to be a leader, the less you will be a leader. The more people will kill you on the net. Second, while they start in the internet, they become a movement by occupying the urban space. They always go into the urban space. Why? There are a couple of things. First, the togetherness, which is fundamental, requires at some point the most direct expression of emotional bonding. You touch the other. Internet, you connect but you don't still touch the other. But when you are together, when you share the danger, and when you share space, when you share a new form of being together in the city, then something else happens. There is a moment of psychological and personal transformation. Moreover, if you are in urban space, anyone can join by just going there. Even disagreeing with the discussions, with the goals, with everything, but you don't have to agree on anything. Just by being there, you're part of the movement. Simply by being there. So it's literally open-ended in, in that sense. And then the problem is the start. Some people join for the opposite uh, reasons that why others were. As you know, one part of the Tea Party movement in the United States joined a movement that fundamentally was more uh, on the democratic side, when, uh, but both, they share the same thing. Uh, they share the rejection of traditional polit political institutions. So in that sense, uh, that's why I say it depends on your opinion if, if you are for these movements or not. But the movements are such, are autonomous, potent, and sharing certain projects. The other reason why movements need urban space is because since they don't have a form of institutional action, they have to exist in society by being there, by being visible, visible for the media, visible for society, and also by challenging the institutions. If you say, I cannot occupy this space, and I occupy this space, well, you can send the police, but you have to acknowledge that something is going on in terms of the protest of society. That's what, tactically speaking, in all these movements, they always have a simple norm. If we are 20, they are going to kill us. If we are 2,000, much less. And if we are 20,000, they will let us quiet as long as we're 20,000. Um, so there is the capacity to challenge society. Uh, it's, um, it's, a different, it's a different form when it goes through physical occupation. The space that is organized between the autonomy of internet networks and the autonomy of urban space occupied by these movements, that space is a form, what I call the third space, which I call the space of autonomy. Space of autonomy in the networks, the, sta the, the space of autonomy in the um, uh, communities that are formed locally. This space of autonomy is the form of existence of the new social movements. Thirdly, these movements are all local and global at the same time. They, they rise for local conditions, local cultures, local values in, in their own terms, in their own language, and rooted into the specific conditions that provoke their outrage. 
they have different faiths, they, they have different political orientation, they have different relationship to gender, to class, to race, etc. They are local, but at the same time, they immediately connect to the world and they immediately bring problems of the world into their discussion, into their debates. They're both things at the same time. They're local and global, as the internet. Internet is local and global. These movements are local and global. In terms of their genesis, these movements are largely spontaneous in their origin. Usually, they are triggered by a spark of indignation. That's the name of the Spanish movement, the indignance. People are indignated for, by something. In some cases, uh, in the cases of the Arab revolutions, self-immolation, repression, savagery from the dictatorship. In the case of Syria, uh, 19 children younger than 12, sorry, younger than 14 being tortured for having given a graffiti. That's how it started the Syrian revolution. Um, in other cases, like uh, in, in, in Europe or in, or in many, many countries in Europe, Spain, certainly the United States, is indignation against the behavior, not so much of the financial elite, but of the political elites being subservient to the financial elite. The obvious thing in the United States, they say the banks, not us. That's the typical thing. Uh, there are solid opinion polls that, yes, the people consider that for, in America, 47% uh, of the people are against the, the financial executives and consider them responsible from, uh, for the economic crisis. But when asked about the relative responsibility between government of all political orientations and bankers, say government, government, because government was supposed to protect us, and in fact they protect the bankers against us. And that's where the indignation comes. And that's why there is a reaction link to the economic crisis, both in Europe and the United States. The financial crisis has meant for people of all persuasion, the bankers have the governments in their pocket. They ruin the world, they ruin the economy, they control everything. And when they are in trouble, they are bailed out with our money. And this goes from Greece to Ohio. These movements are viral. They follow the logic of the internet networks. First, because of the virality of messages in the internet, and particularly images. Images have a tremendous viral effect. People talk a lot about Facebook and Twitter, etc. The most important social network in the internet in terms of the impact of the movement is YouTube. Because the power of the images that everybody can generate, citizen journalists, remember, uh, you have, anybody can, with a cell phone, immediately record an image, make a video, upload it, and seeing people like you being massacred, being brutalized, uh, being in the United States, being um, uh, paper gas uh, in your eyes, for doing nothing, in other countries just machine gun down. Um, but depending on every context, people immediately become indignant. The more there is a violent repression, the more there is support for the movement. There's more fear, but more support at the same time. The transition from outrage to hope is accomplished in all movements by deliberation in the space of autonomy. There is nation, there is outrage, but then when people construct their space of autonomy, meaning both in the internet and they occupy the space, they start debating. Why so? What can we do? Deliberation in the traditional Habermasian sense. In the traditional Habermasian sense. Just does not happen in the parliament. Happens in the civil society. Horizontal networks, both in the internet and the urban space, create this togetherness that I was mentioning about. And the horizontality of networks supports cooperation and solidarity with, while undermining the need for formal leadership. Now, here is one point. These movements have been considered to be very ineffective. They debate for hours, for days, about what to do, a little thing. So they are ineffective. Well, except that they are asking them to be effective on a logic that is not theirs, uh, because 
the fact that they, everything can be challenged means that everybody feels that there are no bosses there, that they can be there and talk and contribute. And yes, grassroots deliberate democracy is very slow and very painful, uh, and many people get fed up. But they have tried, our societies, they have tried in the last years every other possible avenue. Give me a leader, give me a program, we go. Well, we go, usually it doesn't work, and when it works, um, it ends up in institutional blockage. But very important, these movements are extremely critical from traditional radical politics, from particularly from less wing, of left-wing kind, Trotskyite, formal anarchists, organized anarchists, which by definition, if they're organized, they're not anarchists, that's the point. Uh, they are extremely critical of, of all these groups because they say, well, they keep repeating the, I, the, the revolutionary mantra forever and nothing happens. Um, so, and they are organizing the revolution but in their minds, in their homes, but nothing happens in society. So let's just see together what we can do. No ideology, except the ideology of not having ideology, which is another ideology, of course. But it's a different one, less formalized and less blocking. They are highly self-reflective. They keep all the time asking themselves, what, what do we want, who we are, how we can contribute or not contribute. There are endless debates and endless proposals. There is a flurry of every possible proposal. People invent here, I have seen in the Barcelona occupation the, some of the most sophisticated discussions about Heidegger, Heidegger and the revolution, Heidegger and democracy. By the way, people in these movements are usually much more educated than the average of society. And some people say, well, that's a problem, so there's not a real working class guy. Well, that's insulting the working class guy. Um, but, but in addition, it, uh, what happens is that some people debate at the very high levels, self-reflective, but if you have not read Plato, you still can say your thing and will be discussed and will be integrated into the debate and into the proposal. Now, in their origin, they are all non-violent movements. And I emphasize that because this is absolutely critical, um, including in the Arab revolutions. We are now horrified by the civil war in Libya, um, first and then now in Syria. Well, the Syrian movement started as an absolutely peaceful movement for months and months and months in which they were massive. Before there was any armed resistance in Syria, over 7,000 people had been killed in peaceful demonstrations in the streets. Yes, at one point, if they keep massacring you, there is a moment in which people cannot overcome that. But by not overcoming that, and this has been debated many times in the movement, you destroy yourself, even if you win. Why? Because who are going to win? The peaceful demonstrators, the civil society? No. The people financed by Saudi Arabia, Qatar, who organized the Free Syrian Army in the Sunni Shia debate in the Middle East. Okay? So then, yes, you can overthrow Assad. But, but, who is overthrowing Assad? And they lose, and then they start fracturing, and then they say they, they lose the. the the legitimacy among large segments of the population. At the same time, it's logical, it's normal. I'm just saying, when a social movement goes from a social movement, democratic, non-violent social movement, to a contending faction in a civil war, even if you win the civil war, you have lost already your existence as a social movement. Ah, but it's very difficult to just keep the non-violence going. In, and in every country, the debate about violence and non-violence is fundamental because non-violence means heroic resistance in the long term. Violence means losing the legitimacy in the society in the short term. Movements are also rarely programmatic. They are not programmatic. They don't have a program. In other words, they have thousand programs. You know, everybody has an idea. 
And many commissions and many committees elaborate programs. I, I, in Spain, I participated in elaborating a reform of the electoral law, which is one of the most important things because all the laws uh, in, in all the countries are pipe. Uh, they're, they're made in, in the interest of the parties who wrote the law, not in, not in the interest of democracy. This crazy thing about the American Electoral College from the medieval institutions of the United States uh, makes everybody crazy. Who, the, the, the notion of one person, one vote is not respected anywhere. Well, yes, one country, Israel, and that's interesting. That's interesting, uh, direct proportionality. Then political scientists in the US said, well, it's ineffective. How everybody can have an opinion. We have to consolidate blocks. Yeah, sure, you can do that, it's very effective, but you lose the people. And in the, in the case of Greece, if you want a, a blatant example, uh, in the last Greek election that the entire European establishment pushed to vote for the two large parties, uh, the Conservative Party that won the election got 30% of the vote. The opposing left party got 28% of the vote. But why then they got absolute majority in the Conservative Party? Because a little clause in the, in the um, Greek law says that in a parliament of 300 people, the, the, the party that wins by one vote gets 50 seats, more than allocated by the proportional vote, okay? So again and again and again. So uh, the, the reaction is that um, first we have to um, change uh, the, the power structure before any program can be implemented. And in the meantime, uh, there are so many proposals on every aspect of life. And one of the most potent movements in Europe has been for agroecological food, the, inside the movement. Uh, and trying to practice in the movement new principles of agroecology. People can, cannot eat whatever they want. Um, they, they have to debate before uh, distributing food of any kind. Um, but overall, what they are in essence in terms of the program. They are not programmatic in the sense they don't have any specific program. They are fundamentally democratic movements. The most important thing is the search for democracy, a new form of democracy, but not in a program, but in a practice. Practicing this kind of democracy and experimenting with it to see what it is. What is grassroots democracy? What is, they, they are not challenging representative democracy in the traditional terms. They are saying, you know, this representative democracy does not represent. Um, the norms of representation are biased, are changed. Uh, the principle is to complement this democracy, which is, they, they don't use the traditional Marxist term, formal democracy, bourgeois democracy. No, 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 no. They say representative democracy is okay. It's just not representative. And therefore, we have to invent new forms of democracy through, through what people call network democracy, which, of course, is nice and easy to, to say and try to find it in the, in, the, uh, in the debates, in the assemblies, in the local assemblies, but uh, no one knows what it is. Uh, but you know what it is? It's a utopia. It's utopian. And people say, so what? Uh, utopias are not fantasies, are not stupidities. Utopias are ideas about how the world should be and how the political world should be. And utopias are material force because utopias take over the minds and the minds can generate new proposals. All major political ideologies and political systems have been utopias. Liberalism is a utopia, uh, communism is a utopia, anarchism is a utopia, socialism, the traditional sense of socialism, is a utopia. Utopias are the matrices of what happens then in real life to a number of intermediations, to a number of negotiations between what people want and what really happens in society. And this leads me to final point on what is the connection then between political change and this social movement. Well, social movements per se are not political movements, although they are very political, you see, uh, in, in which sense? They are not trying to seize the state. No one thinks to transform into a political party and seize the state. When they do that, become a political party, and that's a different thing. Uh, they are trying to transform consciousness to 
through this transformation of consciousness, through this awareness or this deliberation, then they expect that at some point citizens will change differently the forms of the state. Crazy? Well, no. Iceland? Yeah, 330,000 people. Uh, but not necessarily idiots. Um, the Iceland, uh, Iceland, uh, Iceland, as you know, um, not only brought down the, the entire government coalition that had been governing since 1927, one party or the other, and brought in a eco-social democrat coalition that was always marginal, brought into the government, uh, but not only that, they reformed the economy, they nationalized the banks, they sent to jail all the bankers, they put on trial the prime minister, and moreover, they crowdsourced a new constitution over the internet. 16,000 people participated, and they now have a new constitution crowdsourced on the internet. Not that this is the end of, of uh, Ireland, but it's, it's something there. Um, and by the way, the uh, Icelandic economy is the best performing economy in Europe uh, nowadays, better than Germany. According to all the rating agencies, you better uh, trust the sovereign debt of Iceland than the sovereign debt of Germany. Because they are stable, because they have control on who, who they are and how they connect. While Germany ultimately depends if Spain or Italy go belly up, Germany goes belly up. Uh, so don't invest in Germany yet. Now, if they are not trying to transform the political system directly, what happens then? Well, a lot will depend on how the political system reacts. That's why the title of my conclusion in the book is um, Social Movements and Reform Politics, an Impossible Love? Maybe, maybe not. Because if the political class understands that these are symptoms, whatever distorted, whatever exaggerated, whatever enraged sometimes, of a fundamental distrust in society toward the current political institutions. If they sincerely want to construct and reconstruct democracy rather than get away with crime, if they do that, and some may do, Obama is not doing it, some may do, well, things could change. Because throughout history, this has always been the movement of social movements external to the system that at one point open up spaces of debate and freedom into the system. And then the parties that don't follow that fall apart. I make a comparison with late 19th century Europe in which the political establishment in the democratic countries, in the democratic countries, England, let's say, uh, France to some extent, were the conservatives and the liberals, right? And suddenly the society is transformed. There are new social movements with new ideologies that seem to be crazy, uh, anarchism, socialism, um, because they represent the new society that was emerging and was not represented in the political institutions. What happened? The liberals disappear basically. Not the conservatives. Why the conservatives not? Because the conservatives don't change fundamentally. They change the names, the labels, the, the framing of the ideology. Defending the dominant interests of society is the easiest way. You just go with the flow. We just go who, whoever is in society. But if you are raison d'etre in society for the liberal, for the uh, left of the political system, is to represent the interests of society, not the interests of the elites, then you have a problem if you don't do that. The same thing is happening now in Europe, and maybe to some extent in the United States with the Democrats, um, if they do not represent all the outraged indignation and lack of hope vis-a-vis -vis the subservience of the political elite uh, on the financial elite, well, you will have Tea Party, and the, or, at, or you will have, or we will have, in Europe and here, the notion that no government is good, so let's do ourselves. And by doing ourselves, it starts with our taxes, our money, why I should give it to you if I don't trust you, so no taxes, 
of my defense, huh, I have my gun, why me? Well, in Europe they are disarmed already, but maybe, you know, it <laughs> could be uh, in a, a Washington-based think tank that will start uh, distributing, diffusing in, in Europe the idea that armed citizens are the only ones who can really defend the republic. Um, so to a large extent, if the, let's say, progressive elements of the political system do not respond to the new conditions of society, then move and fill in. But at the same time, they don't have the institutional capacity to do it. But ultimately, the, myth, the most positive influence of the movement in politics may happen to through the change of the basic ideas and the basic themes of, of society. In the United States, the notion that the, um, there is a cleavage, regardless of the statistical demagoguery, between the 9%, the 1% and the 99%. No one talked about this. We knew about income inequality, we knew about this, but now the whole society, including comedians, and let alone even the Congress, they started to talk about the 1%, the 99%. That means what for people? Well, this society, apparently, the society of opportunity, no, is with fundamental social inequality. This change is up here, up here. Now, the political response to that depends. Can be right-wing politics, can be uh, demagogy, etc. but changes the, ter the terms of the debate. You know, one very interesting opinion poll data in the, in the United States is that uh, the United States always has refused in the public mind the notion of so social conflict between rich and poor, class struggle, if you want to call it. Well, according to the Pew Institute, in, in 2009, the proportion of people who thought that the conflict between rich and poor was the defining conflict in society was 45%. In 2011, 70%. Meaning the notion that there is a conflict between rich and poor that is exactly contrary to the American ideology, in which the only problem for the poor is that they're not rich yet, but they will. They will eventually become rich. Uh, well, people are saying no because of the 99% debate. Because now, and lastly, the people in the movement, the language of the movement, say all this discussion about what, what are we accomplishing? What is ultimately the result? They say this is in fact a reflection of the productivist logic of capitalism. If you don't produce something, you are nothing. Well, maybe the debate is wrong. Maybe the outcome the important thing is not the outcome, but the process. Because the process is a transformative force. Why? Because it's what you do materially. Deliberation, discussion, projection. All this is the material practice. And it's the material practice that changes people's mind. And that, finally, may have necessarily has to translate into something. That's what the movement people say. We, don't, we are going to vote, sure. But who cares? We know it's not going to solve the problems in the next election. But what about in the election 20 years from now? That's what social movements like the women movement, the environmental movement, the civil rights movement were saying 20, 25 years ago. It's just a different timing. It's not the next election, it's the next society. And that's the space where social movements agree. Still the most important thing is how communicative autonomy has impacted the overcoming of fear. And I want to finish by reading a um, tweet uh, from Tahrir Square from a woman named Raiwal Husaini, but the tweet she signs Surya Strong that treats like this. We have brought down the wall of fear. You brought down the wall of our house will rebuild our homes, but you will never build again that wall of fear. And that is the transformation. Thank you for your attention.
Uh, Dr. Castells has agreed to take questions. Please wait for the microphone. You handle the, you, you, you point at yeah, me. Okay. Hi, I'm Mike Hi. Nelson. I'm a writer for Bloomberg Government. I'm also a professor of Internet Studies at Georgetown University. I think you've done a wonderful job of giving us an overview of what's happening in social movements targeted at changing national governments. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about how social movements might change corporate government and how boycotts by consumers, shareholder action, might be enabled by social media and whether you're op optimistic or pessimistic that that will change the way corporations function. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, you know, the interesting thing about these movements is that they are multidimensional. They touch on everything. And, but this everything ultimately means how things are managed everywhere. So you're absolutely right. Uh, they focus on government because of the the rise of the movement was linked to the financial crisis and the, 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 the disastrous management that governments have done with the financial crisis. In some cases, they couldn't even tame the financial crisis. But even when they have more or less, like in the United States, has been at the expense of breaking the trust of the, of the citizens in, in, that, in that management. So therefore, the mainstream of the, of the movement has concentrated there. But there are all kinds of discussion, and one of, the, of those that you mentioned is absolutely about corporate governance. Remember all the discussions about the bank fees with the Bank of America, uh, about uh, the, the, the many people have actually switched from uh, their banks to credit unions. Uh, in, in a number of uh, states, particularly in, the, in Washington state, there are a number of experiments in which people are creating their own community banks. And they don't work worse than the others <laughs> at this point. Uh, in, um, I have been investigating in Europe a huge movement of what they call ethical banking, in which are literally at this point there are over five million people in Europe uh, doing ethical banking, meaning uh, you, it's in fact a cooperative. I mean, you, the profits are for the members of the of the of the bank, and 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 they invest only uh, in terms to um, get enough return to keep the bank going. Um, I have not mentioned, because I focus on the more politically oriented movements, I have not mentioned my other research, which is my next book, meaning published in November, not in October, um, which is, uh, is, called, um, is called Another Life is Possible, Alternative Economic Culture During the Crisis, which is also empirically grounded and is about all the forms in which people are transforming their lives. And this is a huge debate within the movement. People who are more traditional social movement, we have to change the councillors, we have to go through a political institution. Many other people who are in the movement as well say, well, you know, this is going to be long term. Yeah, we'll do it, but it's going to be long term. I am 35, what the hell? I want my better life now, uh, not when we make the revolution. The revolution can wait, but I cannot wait. Um, and therefore, a huge movement of time sharing, uh, time banks, um, alternative financing, um, self-consumption, self self-production, economic practices, but under a completely different logic. And I would actually concur with some implicit thing in your statement. This, in the short term, is going to be more materially, practically effective because people know that they already live differently. Uh, at this point in Europe, the, uh, here I don't, I don't think so, but I don't know the precise data. In Europe, m the majority of people agree with the notion of working less and being paid less. Well, and why? Because, uh, because, well, life is something else than just uh, work for, for a pay. Interesting, which at the same time is massive unemployment. Well, you can take massive unemployment as a tragedy or as an opportunity. <laughs> Since they are not going to employ me anyway, uh, let's organize their life around a different set of values. And there is an increasing movement in those sense. Even in the most ideological um, uh, factions, there is a huge degrowth movement. 
uh, meaning arguing for slowing economic growth and actually starting growing negatively, not growing more in terms of the national product. And as you know, there's a huge branch of economics now developing, economics of happiness, which among other things use the, the Bhutan, Bhutan of all places, uh, the Bhutan Gross National Happiness Index, uh, which is being debated in the world. In other words, what I'm saying is that beyond the more specifically political movements, there is a tectonic change in the culture because there is universal distrust in global financial capitalism, not in capitalism, not in, the, in other forms of capitalism, in this particular form of capitalism. When you ask people, they are not, the, the majority, they say, no, capitalism is okay. Is this capitalism? Is this global financial capital with no control, speculative, no entrepreneurial, no creating wealth, but inventing wealth and taking our wealth from us? That one is, is, a, is a fundamental movement coupled with the crisis of political legitimacy. You bring together the two, the two things. People don't trust those who have their money and don't trust those who have their votes we are in a tectonic change that has different expressions. Uh, interested in the intercultural aspects of, of your theory. Uh, you didn't touch much on China or Far Eastern cultures with other quite distinctive cultural characteristics. There's a lot of universalism that, that you talk about, but when we get to these issues of governance and, and uh, the way societies work, they reflect some sort of cultural norm, some common values, and the internet phenomenon, as you talk about the communications, the theory you're espousing, has to affect that in some way or another. Could you, could you perhaps address the intercultural aspects and what makes this universal in your mind uh, so that normative values, what's right, wrong, good, bad, what defines a society or affected by your theory? Thank you. Um, well, two layers of this. On the one hand, there is no cultural homogeneity in the world, empirically speaking, but cultural diversity is increasing, not diminishing. Except that on top of this, some kind of a global cosmopolitan culture of two, of two kinds. Consumerism, that's a global universal culture, and at the same time, uh, humankind, as, uh, as a species with common values of preservation, preservation of the species, preservation of nature, let's say e ecology in the broadest sense. They are the two things. So one is clearly capitalist, the other is not. Um, and these are the, the universal cultures expanding. And in that sense, there is cultural identity in terms of national, ethnic, religious, etc., increasing, but two, these two major cultures that are increasingly shared. The, there is another um, aspect of the shared culture, which I think is new and is linked to internet. What is shared is the culture of sharing, meaning that I go into the internet, I find my people, and I connect, and I construct a new subculture, but at the same time in combination with other cultures, but we all agree that the internet is fundamental. That's the culture of sharing. And that's why a battle is, is being already launched, not only anonymous, many other things, in terms of defending the internet. Why? Because the internet is the common grounds of our age. If, if people feel expropriated from the internet, particularly teenagers and young people, that's the only way they can start making bombs. Uh, if you take away what they can do in the internet, whatever they want, that's really something. So this culture of sharing is, is quite fundamental. The political culture, I would say, is to a large extent um, still, I would say, liberal democracy in the traditional term uh, is, is growing as the shared political culture. In most countries, people agree that elections are important, are fundamental, but on this and therefore there is the contradiction within China nowadays. But on the other hand, um, the, the sharing of this uh, political culture, in most cases, particularly in the, in the social movements, incorporate another dimension. Part participatory democracy 
becomes the new frontier of democracy. Pure representative democracy without participatory democracy is in fact empty and will soon be ineffective in managing the processes of self-government. Now, why is participatory democracy now possible? And there are very interesting discussions about, in terms of the history of the movement that we're arguing about grassroots democracy, participatory democracy, and always in the 19th century, early 20th century, the thing, everybody agreed with that, but it was not practical because they have to, at one point, decide, and you could not scale up. Internet allows you to scale up. So the age of network democracy seems to have arrived. So there is an old discussion between Marxists and anarchists. The Marxists say, no, power has to be centralized because otherwise it's not effective. And anarchists say, well, but when it's centralized, then it becomes a dictatorship. Uh, but now anarchists, what I call the neo-anarchists, because they are not organizational anarchists, are saying, you know what? The, you Marxists always said the, the, the development of the productive forces allows different forms of social organization. That's exactly what happened, but it was not communist. So communist was the ideology of the 19th century. Anarchists is the one of the 21st century because now the internet allows decentralized democracy, decentralized participation, collective decision making, etc. And I find it's a fascinating discussion. Yeah, We're already a little over time, over time. It'll be just one last question. Um, let's see who is That's waiting. my fault. <laughs> I think you, you were the next one in line. <laughs> Profits and people that work um, in social movements or building them uh, fit in with all this technology. So what do you have to think Thank about Thank you very that? much. This is a fundamental question, both uh, uh, theoretically and practically. Look, um, to give a, a short answer, so we can continue the discussion later. Um, without uh, social networks in the internet, these movements would not exist, simply. Would be other social movements, could be others, but this is a, a, a hypothetical question. Every of these movements, all the protests, all the actions everywhere start with the internet. And, and therefore, the only relevant question, in my opinion, is which are the material and cultural consequences of going through the internet, at least for a substantial part of the movement on the interaction. Uh, the discussion that I found, frankly, empty uh, about can the revolution be tweeted or not, the revolution was not tweeted, oh yes, it was tweeted. Well, empirically, it was tweeted, actually. Uh, you cannot explain the, uh, their wonderful analysis by uh, Gillard Lawton and others and, and in, in, in tweet flow, uh, good researchers that show empirically how the tweets organize the Arab revolutions. Um, but at the same time, were well, not only the tweets, but without the tweets, you cannot explain the process, the development, the participation, etc., etc. So that's the point. Technology, as always, is embedded into the social practice. So it starts with other reasons, for, but without the technology, this movement would have been crushed again. And for me, the most important thing in Egypt is the comparison between how the 2008 uh, attempt, um, uh, particularly in the, in the working class city, uh, northern of Cairo, was crushed with thousands of people killed, and the same people who survived that created the April 6 movement that then, using Tunisia as the trigger, the same people started another kind of movement on the internet in January 2011, and it worked, you see? So, uh, therefore, I think at this point, you cannot imagine uh, social movements or non-profit organizations or um, uh, advocacy uh, groups or the Tea Party, for that matter, um, without the internet and the implications of the internet. But the internet has implications, needs interactivity, needs horizontality. You know, when politicians decided that, oh, sure, we forgot the internet. Um, Obama was the first one in the world who really understood uh, what the, the potential of the internet, and that was decisive. For the finance of the campaign, from the organization of the campaign, we know that. Now, all politicians want to, to do the same. How? Oh, the magic potion. We have a good website, a good internet network, and we win. Well, internet, in, in one word, the def cultural definition of internet is one word, autonomy. Internet is the technology of autonomy. If you are not ready to give autonomy 
to the movement behind you, you better don't try the internet because you may have a problem. Uh, because if people really take seriously their autonomy and have the technological tools to be, they will not need you. So, um, and, and now Obama continues with his things about the internet and so on, but it not work in the same way, right? Uh, because people autonomously decided otherwise. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.